right, let's open up our Bibles once again to the book of uh, Ruth. Now, we come to chapter 3 and 4 tonight. These are two um, uh, very short chapters, so I think that we'll, we'll be able to take them in, in one bite this evening. Um, you now, it's so important that we, we take, uh, particularly here in chapter 3, that we view this not through an American lens. If you try and understand this story through our American understanding, you're going you're gonna to think, what in the world am I reading here? So it's very important uh, that we try and view all of this through that ancient Israeli lens and understand what their customs were and what their traditions um, were. Now, we're dealing with a family of Ephrathites, all right? Now, who, who in the world are, are those people? You know, oftentimes, and, and you, you see this all the time, where you'll have, you'll have multiple towns that have the same name. Right, you got Jackson, Michigan. You've got Jackson, uh, Mississippi. Uh, you know, you got Paris, Indiana. You got Paris, Texas. Right? You got Paris, Tennessee. And and so, if a person says, "Hey, meet me at such a town," well, which which there's there's a number of those. So which one? And so we designate those towns by also including the state and designating what what city we're talking about. Well, in ancient Israel, they had a couple of Bethlehems. They had Bethlehem Zebulun way to the north, up there in the region of Galilee, and then you had uh, Bethlehem uh, Ephratha. Uh, and uh, this is the Bethlehem where Jesus was born. This was the ancestral home uh, of David. And this is where uh, this family that we're talking about was dwelling in. And uh, in, in, for example, Genesis uh, 35, 19, now Rachel died and she was buried in the way to Ephrathah, uh, which is uh, Bethlehem. So we're talking about a, a, a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law, and this mother-in-law has really, she's lost everything, hasn't she? They cashed out when a famine hit the area of Bethlehem, and they went over to the plateau of, of Moab. And of course, the husband, he never returned. He died there. So she loses her husband, and then she loses her two sons. And then she ends up, she's got two daughters-in-law, and she says to the daughters-in-law in the region of Moab, look, why don't you guys go home? Just go back to your parents. I don't, I don't really have anything to offer you. And one of them does. And one daughter-in-law stays, this incredibly um, wonderful young lady uh, by the name of Ruth. Now, we have to remember that Ruth's husband has died and has not left a child. There's no heir involved. You got, you got the mother-in-law and you've got the daughter-in-law. There's no grandbaby in the picture. Now, we have, to, we have to understand what their economy was. Their economy was, I suppose, a form of capitalism. There was private property ownership. You didn't work for the collective. You didn't work for the state. You certainly paid taxes, but you, you had private property rights. Now, the interesting thing is, is that you never owned real estate. It, it, we've got Israel. They're all up in arms right now. Palestinians and Israelis alike, they're all at each other's throats over there right now because Israel has been pushing for more and more settlements, and that now has the Arab world all, all upset. And there's debates, right? Who does the land belong to? Jews are saying it's our land. Palestinians are saying it's our land. It's neither one of their lands. God says it's my land, right? He brings them to the border of Israel under Moses. And you remember that he says to them, all right, I allowed the Canaanites to be in my land. They were idiots, and so now they're going to get kicked out. If you're an idiot in the promised land, the land's going to vomit you out as well. The land belongs to the Lord. Now, because of that, when Israel came in to take the land, that the Lord divided it among families. So the Joneses, you know, they got this territory over here. And the Smiths, they got that territory over there. Now, let's say that you're, you're a Jones, right? And so as an individual Jones family, 
You'd get your 40 acres, you'd get your 60 acres, and you could do with that whatever it is that you wanted to do. You wanted to have an orchard, a vineyard, you wanted to raise cattle, you wanted to have crops, you could do whatever you wanted to do. But the land, you always understood, belonged to the Lord. And the land had been divided up among families. Now, let's say, as is sometimes the case, a person runs into some financial difficulty. They need some kind of a loan. And so they could sell their real estate. But in reality, all they were doing is leasing their uh, real estate, kind of like a pawn shop. Right? You, go, you go to a pawn shop, and of course, you've got your Rolex watch Lots of people with Rolex watches go to pawn shops, don't they? And, and the, the pawn uh, dealer uh, looks at the watch and says, well, I'll give you 300 bucks. And, and so he gives you a $300 loan and he holds on to that watch. And as long as you're making payments, He's holding on to that watch of your, your, your mother's ring, your grandmother's ring, or something precious that you've pawned, and, and now you're making payments on it. Now, if you stop making payments, well, then you're going to put grandma's ring out there in the counter, and somebody might run off with grandma's ring. Well, that's kind of what real estate was. I would go to my neighbor and say, hey, I've run into a little bit of difficulty. Um, could you uh, loan me uh, money? And then the neighbor would have access uh, to use uh, the land until either I paid it back or we had a year of jubilee. And every 50 years, there was a reset in the economy. And all the land went back to the original families, and all uh, debts uh, were forgiven. Imagine what it would be like to be in a nation where there's a reset every 50 years. There's, everybody kind of gets a do-over. Now, along with that, they had what was known as the Leverite marriage. And the Leverite marriage is where you have a woman who marries one of her husband's relatives when he died and did not leave an heir. So then the first child that this widow would have with her second husband, that very first child would be considered the legal heir of the dead brother or the dead cousin or whatever relationship that man uh, had. So we have to understand that for a woman to have security in ancient Israel, it was directly tied to having a husband or having sons. Now, we have to understand that women in this country, there's no, yeah, there's inequity when it comes to employment, and there are no doubt glass ceilings that do exist. But understand that women in this country, economically, they've got it pretty good. 45% of all American millionaires are women. In fact, 48% of estates that are valued over $5 million are controlled by women. Women currently control 51% of personal wealth, $14 trillion. It is estimated by 20 30, that they're going to control 66% of personal wealth in our nation. So there's no real comparison that we can look to in today's world to understand just how desperate women were in that ancient world. So now we've got two very desperate women. They are looking for security. Uh, they are looking to bring a great guy uh, into the life now of this daughter-in-law. And so the mother-in-law, um, uh, she's going to swing into action here. And uh, we've got Boaz. Now, we were introduced to Boaz last time. Great guy, a type of Christ, a picture of Christ here. Um, a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful guy. So you've got the, this family in Bethlehem, right? And, uh, and so now, uh, notice what happens beginning in verse 1. Then Naomi, uh, her mother-in-law, uh, said to her, that is, said to Ruth, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that, you may, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz whose young women you were with, remember during that whole, you know, gleaning process, you're, you're familiar with the guy, you're familiar with some of his farmhands, if you will. Uh, is he not our relative? In fact, 
He is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So Naomi now, the mother-in-law, she kind of becomes this little matchmaker, uh, if you will. And uh, notice this nosy Jewish mother. Uh, she's the, even uh, figured out his whereabouts. All right, now look. The guy I'm really interested in setting you up with uh, tonight, uh, I, I've got it on a pretty, pretty good word uh, that he's going to be up there winnowing uh, this barley. Now, when, when the barley or when the wheat was being winnowed, that's the last process, right? So, so this is bringing the harvest now to an end. And after the harvest, they'd, they'd, they'd have a celebration. You know, after they'd winnowed all of this, and now they just have a big pile of grain, you know, they're bringing out the wine and the hors d'oeuvres, and they're having karaoke, I suppose, and they're just having a, a, a great time there. And uh, now this is where it gets a little weird for us if we're looking at this through an American 21st century uh, lens. Because notice that she, she then said, all right, now that's, that's where your man is going to be. Now, what you need to do, I want you to take a bath, right? That's always very good before a date that you would take a bath, I suppose, and get yourself all dolled up. Maybe a pair of heels might not look bad on you, you know, bath bomb, oil of Olay, whatever it is that you got to do there. And uh, just, you know, make yourself look uh, as presentable and, and wait for it. You just kind of hang out in the shadows there and wait for the party uh, to come to an end. Now, these guys would sleep with the grain because they, they've been working all day and then they have this little party. They're, they're celebrating. They're, they've, uh, they've been blessed now with a, with a harvest and it's late at night, so they're not going to travel home. So they would just sleep there. Again, you're talking about the second, third week of June. It's very, it's very pleasant uh, to, to sleep underneath the stars. And, and so they're, they're going to sleep there, of course, because they don't want anybody to rip off their, their grain. Right? So she says, you, you, you just wait now for them to, uh, for, for Boaz to lay down. And notice in verse 4, then it shall be that when he lies down, you shall notice the place where he lies. You don't want to end up with the wrong guy, all right? So you make sure you keep an eye on this dude where he's laying down, and you're going to go in, and you're going to uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what he should do. And uh, she, that would be Ruth, said to Naomi, her mother-in-law, uh, all of this I will uh, do as uh, you've, you've told me to, to do. Now, we look at this and uh, we think, well, this, I mean, is this something that is of a sexual nature that's, uh, that's going on here? Is this, is this some kind of an illicit uh, affair that we're, we're reading about here? What, what is going on is that this is a marriage proposal that is uh, taking place here, right? He is the kinsman redeemer. He is the one who can step in to the distress of these two women's lives and become their security. He's the one who's in a position where he can straighten out all of the heartache that's going on uh, in their life. So go in and you kind of uncover. I mean, you know how it is. You're sleeping and all of a sudden your feet's cold. Like, what is, why, why is my feet cold, right? And you look down there, and here's a woman. Ah, ah, you know, there's a woman. That you're, who in the world, right? So here he is. He's sound asleep. She's now down there. She pulls back the covers of his feet, and he wakes. Now, notice in verse 9, uh, he said, who are you? And uh, uh, she, so she answered, I'm, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing for, right? Now, this is what she's informing him of. You are the closest uh, relative. So she is not pursuing sexual activity. She is not making herself available for that. But she is saying to him, uh, you have a family responsibility, you have a family responsibility to raise up an heir for this dead relative, and you have a responsibility 
uh, for uh, purchasing back uh, the land. Now, verse 7, the message, I, I really think that Eugene Peterson has it right here. Uh, she lay down to signal her availability uh, for marriage. And she says to him that you are now the close relative or literally you are the Gaal, you are the kinsman redeemer. You are the one who is in line to step up, redeem the land, marry me. Our first child will then be the legal heir of my deceased husband. The Orthodox Jewish Bible puts it this way, for you are a goel, a redeemer. Uh, Young's literal translation, for thou art a redeemer. NIV puts it, the guardian, the redeemer of our family. Christian Standard Bible puts it, you are uh, my family redeemer. So she's not looking, shall we say, for a roll in the hay, all right? Not literally uh, looking for that, but rather what she is simply saying there is that you have a family responsibility to take care of this and right the wrongs that have taken place. Now, what's interesting is his response in verse 10, and I think, I think we, we see a little bit of insight here on why he's been a little slow at the switch. Now, remember, initially when he's introduced, he really notices this young gal, right? He, he takes note of her, and he's very impressed with her, paying her a lot of compliments, uh, giving her... Um, uh, gifts, if you will. I mean, there, there's clearly a connection, uh, but so, so why the hesitation on his part? And I think we have it here really in verse 10. Um, he said unto her, he said, blessed are you of the Lord. Now, my daughter, all right, now this is a word that would indicate he's, he's recognizing there's, a, there's an age difference here. He's speaking to her as a younger woman. He's, he's recognizing that there's quite an age gap here. You have to understand, Ruth is 20, maybe, early 20s, whereas Boaz, I mean, this guy is literally, he's old enough uh, to be her, her father, right? So he says unto her, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning. Now, you remember, he paid her a compliment when he said to her, hey, I have heard about the kindness that you have shown Naomi, and uh, I, just, I just want you to know that I appreciate this. This is a wonderful thing. Now, he's saying to her, wow, you're being more kind at the end of this road than you were at the beginning. Yes, you were kind there, but now look at you. Look at your kindness and notice what he says in that. So he's, his understanding of her being kind is rooted in that you did not go after uh, young, uh, young men, uh, whether they were uh, rich or poor, right? So this, this old guy is probably very flattered that this young woman, now look, go, go back, uh, ladies, when you were, you know, in your late teens, in, in your early uh, 20s, and you're, you're thinking about, um, you know, wanting some guy to come into your life, and you've got an image of this guy uh, in your mind. Chances are it's a young guy, right? Chances are a 20-something is not going to have an image of some old dude in her mind when she's thinking about a lover uh, coming in into her life. So here is a woman that is making a choice that's contrary against nature, right? Nature would, would have her pursuing a, a younger man, but she realizes that she's got to do what the law of God had prescribed. She's got to do what's right. So rather than doing what would come naturally to her or what she would want naturally, she's doing that which is right and that which is honorable, which is taking care of her dead husband's name and taking care of her dead husband's uh, real estate, if, if you will, right? And so she's putting her, her wants and her wishes on the side, and she's doing um, what, what's right, right? So, so then you'll notice that we got a problem here because Boaz, he says, um, look, the, the problem 
is that there is a nearer relative that is ahead of me. I'm, I'm second in line when it comes to raising up an heir or redeeming the family farm of my dead relatives. There's a guy that's, that's closer, right? So, so when a man would die without having a child, right, you'd line up all of the relatives from those that were close. Maybe he had a younger brother, and then maybe he had a, you know, an, a, you know, the older cousin or whatever. So whatever the family dynamics are, we're not told here that Boaz understands there's a guy that is in front of him. And so he says to Ruth, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of this uh, for you. And he, he gives her uh, a gift. He gives her some, some grain uh, to take home. I suppose that's not as good as an engagement ring, but he gives her this, uh, this uh, grain to take, uh, to take back and to uh, show uh, Naomi. And, um, and, and so I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to go to that relative, and I'm going to see if I can't work it out. Again, here, here's, a, here's another example of a person doing that which is right rather than that which he wants. What does he want? Well, he has this beautiful young lady uh, that no doubt is a very ego-enhancing thing to him who wants to become his wife. That's, that's what he wants. And he could have cut corners, right? I mean, he could have just... He just could have said to the other, oh, I forgot all about you. I'm sorry, you know, my bad, you know, my mistake after, after he's married her. So here are two people that we should be very impressed with, that they are willing to set aside what they would want naturally in order that that which is right is done. And that's how we have to order our lives. And if we'll order our lives by pursuing that which is right, then we can fully expect the blessing of God uh, to be in, in our lives. So uh, Ruth, she goes back home and uh, she tells Naomi, because course, you know, the mother-in-law, she's sitting up. She's got to, you know, tell me, tell me, tell me what happened. And uh, so she tells her uh, what happened. And notice in verse 18, she then says, well, you sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For, and I love this, the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter of this day. I know that guy's character, and I know that guy is a man of his word, and he's going to take care of business, so you don't worry your pretty little head off. Uh, he's going he's gonna to manage this whole thing uh, uh, quite well. Now, for us, here we have Boaz. He is a type of Christ. He's a foreshadowing of Christ. Ruth is a foreshadowing of the church that's redeemed by our kinsman redeemer. And just as Boaz is not going to rest until he has concluded this thing, you can take, brothers and sisters, you can take this to the bank, that your kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is not going to rest until you and I have, a rest, have arrived at the happy shores of heaven. He's going to see us all the way through. He's going to take care of us, and he is going to finish the deal uh, that he has uh, started. So Boaz... He, uh, he goes in uh, chapter 4 here. He goes and he gets the, um, uh, the relative, and he says, all right, now we're going to go down to the gate of the city, and that's where all business happened. You'd have the city officials down there. And so he's got this relative there, and in front of the city officials, he says to them, all right, now look, we got this little real estate problem uh, in our family. We've got this. It, it's got to be redeemed. You know the story. The poor woman, she came back from Moab, and, and now, the, you know, the family farm isn't in the name anymore. And so we really, we really ought to do her a solid. We ought to do the family a solid, and uh, we need to redeem it. And you're kind of next in line. And so, hey, what do you say? And the guy, no doubt to the shock of Boaz, is, all right, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And then, and then Boaz, he says, all right, well, um, now there's part two, all right? The uh, second, second part of the problem here is that we've got this Moabite, right? This Moabite woman uh, that was married to our dead relative. And uh, so she's come back, and now uh, she wants uh, one of the family members uh, to marry her. 
And so this family member says, oh, no, 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 I don't, look, I can't be dragging a Moabite home. I mean, that will disrupt uh, family tranquility uh, like you can't believe. It's going to mess up my inheritance. I, a baby, you want me to, a ba- I can't be bringing a baby into the house right now. I mean, no, 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 I, I, I'm telling you, uh, I, I got to pass. So I'm going to leave that uh, up, up to you. And of course, uh, those words were music to Boaz's ears because that, of course, is what he wanted. Now, get a load of this in verse 7. Now, this was the custom in the former times. Now, we had this in the law, right? We read this. We were going through Deuteronomy. This is the custom of former times in Israel concerning the redeeming and the exchanging to confirm anything that one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this and, and this was a confirmation um, in Israel. Now, what, what in the world is, is that all about? Now, you remember that in the law, if you didn't want to uh, marry a woman to raise up a child for your dead relative, you didn't have to do it. You weren't, you weren't for it. You know, your brother, his wife drove him nuts, and now he's dead, and now you think I'm going to marry her. You're out of your mind. I'm not going to marry that one. Well, the law didn't say that you had to do it. But they had a whole ceremony where she would then take a sandal off of your foot and raise it above her head and say, this man is a shoeless man uh, in Israel. Uh, Because if you see a guy walking around with one shoe, well, that's weird, right? I mean, that's, I mean, you don't walk into a job interview wearing one shoe like you're gonna you're gonna look like a weird I had a friend of mine he was a cop on the Fort Wayne force and he was telling me that one night he was driving down Coliseum Boulevard and there was a guy late at night and uh, blitzed out of his mind and there was a guy uh, walking down the middle of Coliseum Boulevard and he shined the lights on him and uh, and he knew the guy and uh, and he said uh, and the guy had one shoe on and he, he said, hey, hey, Joe, it looks like you, you lost one of your shoes. And he said, lost one? No, I found one, right? And he just put it on. And uh, so you see somebody wearing one shoe. I mean, that's kind of a shameful thing. I mean, poor guy, he's only got, he's only got one shoe. And in that part of the world, the shoe, a shoe in your hand was a, was a sign. It was a picture of... Um, uh, of, of disgrace, if you will. You remember when Iraq fell and Saddam Hussein was thrown out of power? You remember they're dropping all of these statues down? How many pictures did we see of people beating the, the statues of Saddam with, with sandals? Here's a, here's a woman with some purple flip-flops really giving him the business, right? And it was, it's the imagery of of disgrace. You're, you're a disgrace, and we're doing this disgraceful thing. You remember when President Bush was over there, and he was giving that press conference, and there was that guy that threw the shoe at him, remember? In his hometown, this is a monument that they have built in his honor. Great thing that you brought dishonor uh, upon uh, the American president, right? And so uh, he steps out of the way. It's a shameful thing. They take his sandal off, but this is exactly what it was that Boaz wanted, right? And so they, they get hitched, uh, they get married, and uh, sure enough, she gets pregnant, and uh, they, have a, they have a little a little baby boy. And so now they've got the, they got the whole... Uh, Baby shower going on here, I guess. And uh, notice in verse 12 what the people say here. They say, may your house be like the house of of Perez, whom Tamar uh, bore to Judah because of the offspring uh, which the Lord uh, will give unto you uh, from this uh, young woman. Now, that's just kind of a, a weird thing to say because we know the story of Tamar and Judah. What a disgraceful story. Now, maybe these people didn't quite even understand what it was that they were saying, but it's, it's fascinating 
in light of the story of Tamar. Tamar, you remember, dressed up like, like a prostitute and got her father-in-law in between the sheets with her. And then they had this son, Perez, you, you remember. Now, Perez was an illegitimate son. And what did the law say about illegitimate children? In Deuteronomy 30, uh, 23, verse 2, uh, no one of illegitimate birth may enter the assembly of the Lord, nor may any of his descendants even to the 10th generation. So if you had an illegitimate son, none of the offspring could enter into the assembly of God for worship until you came to the 10th generation. Now, here's what's interesting. They say, oh, may your house be like the house of Perez. Notice in verse 18 that we have uh, Perez, that he gave, he gave birth to Hezron, and then Hezron uh, gave birth to Ram, and then Aminadab, and then Aminadab had Nashon. Nashon had uh, Salmon, and of course, Salmon was the father of Boaz. And then Boaz has Obed here that we've read about. And then Obed gave birth to Jesse. And Jesse, uh, he had a son, David. Now, it's very interesting that when you count up the generations, uh, who's the 10th generation? But, but David, they probably had no idea what it was that they were saying. But the curse, so to speak, was broken of course, or came to an end uh, with David. Now, a couple, a couple of closing thoughts. Um, first of all, it's, it's interesting to me that here, here's Boaz. He's a, he's a wealthy guy. He's a mighty man of valor. That's one of the terms that was used of him. He's a very influential guy. He's, he's at a place in life where he's, he's wealthy and everything is set. And now there is the need of this Moabite woman, and you would think, well, why would such a man of renown have any kind of, how, how is it that he would lower himself, so to speak, um, to kind of bring in this person that doesn't really have much of a pedigree at all? And I would suggest that one of the things that was going on with Boaz, like with so many great men, is that they never forget where they have come from. Now, we just read that his father was Salmon, all right? Now, who did Salmon marry? And of course, we're reminded of this when we go to the genealogy of Christ in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, where we read that Salmon begat Boaz by Rahab. You see, this is a man whose mother was a prostitute She's walking the streets, if you will, of Jericho. And he never forgot that. I think that one of the things that keeps us sensitive to how God might want to use us and the opportunities that God might bring our way is that we constantly remind ourselves who we are, what we are, what God has saved us from, no doubt that was the key to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul never forgot. The Apostle Paul said, look, I am, not I was, I am the chief of sinners. The Apostle Paul never forgot what it was that he had been saved from and the delusion that he was saved from. I think that one of the best ways to keep yourself usable in the hands of the living God is do not become full of yourself where you begin to think that you're better than everybody else, but keep yourself low, keep yourself humble, and the Lord will use you. Now, the second thought that I want to end with is as we look at the Redeemer, again, there were three requirements. The Redeemer had to be willing. You couldn't force, she couldn't force Boaz to redeem her in her situation. And she, she's very submissive, right? She's just there. All right, now you just, you just do well, you want to, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not bossing you at all, right? And, and so you, you do what you want to do. A redeemer, it had to be willing. Also had to be qualified. You had to, you had to be a near kinsman. And then you had to be capable. You had to be able to pay whatever price was necessary. And our kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
was all of these. He was willing. It was the joy that was set before him that caused him to endure uh, the cross. The writer of Hebrews tells us, look, this is why he became a man. He became a man so he could become our great high priest. Every priest is taken from among men for men. And he had the capability to do it because he was tested in all ways as we are, yet without sin. Oh, he was so willing. Oh, he loved us to the end, did he not? You know, in a couple of the parables that Jesus gives in uh, Matthew's gospel, you have the parable of the pearl of great price, and you have the parable of the hidden treasure. And people will always want to misapply these parables. And they'll say, oh, Jesus, he's the, he's the pearl of great price. Jesus, he's the treasure. And they'll, no, he's talking about the church. The church is the pearl of great price. The church is the treasure that's hid in the field. And in the parables, what does the Lord say? The man that found the pearl, the man that found the treasure, he went out. He sold all that he had in order that he could buy the pearl, in order that he could have the treasure of great price. Oh, we must understand the great love that the Lord has for us and his view of you. He's, brothers and sisters, he's not angry. He doesn't hate you. He's not about ready to just bap you in the head because he can't stand you anymore. You are this great treasure that he sold. He gave up everything that he had in order that he could have you. He emptied himself. He descended from the throne of God itself. And he came into the depths of the world to die a disgraceful death in order that he might end up with the likes of us. Oh, if that does not fuel your worship, if that does not fuel your appreciation, nothing will. Oh, how he loves us. And so I think as we go to prayer tonight, we should be praying, oh, Lord, help me to stay humble. Help me to stay humble before you. And, Lord, help me appreciate the great love that you have for me. And, Father, we pray that you would enable us to understand just the height and the depth and the breadth of the love of Christ. Father, we marvel that your son emptied himself, took upon himself the form of a servant, humbled himself all the way to that cross, stripped naked, spit on, ripped to shreds for the likes of us. Lord, we don't understand it, but oh, we pray that your spirit will continue to illuminate our hearts. Oh, Father, cause us to be worshipers and not complainers. And Lord, help us, Lord, to be Boaz. Help us to be people of integrity. Help us to be Ruths that seek to do what is right and not what we want by nature. And Father, enable us, Lord, never to forget where we have come from. To Christ be the glory. We worship him, Lord. And we thank you and we ask these things in his name. Amen.